My name is Martin Fulsat, I will be the editor-in-chief of the proceedings of this conference and I'm happy to introduce to you our special guest today, keynote speaker Peter Germany. Peter is uh, by training biochemist, he is from the uh, Semmelweis University in Budapest. His major fields of study are molecular uh, chaperones and networks. Uh, he is uh, especially uh, <laughs> concerned with uh, stress related and aging related networks effects. Uh, he is the author of 14 books and more than 220 scientific papers, the career of several, several honors and rewards. From 2008 to 2010, he was the member of, uh, of the Vice President Committee of the President of Hungary. He serves as an editor of Cell Stresses and Chaperones of Clause 1 and of Nature Scientific Reports. And he will be in May, coming May, uh, in residency in the Rockefeller Foundation, the largest center in the US. Uh, from his many publications, uh, uh, I especially can recommend to you his book, Weak Links, which is really a very, well, a very interesting read and a very well written in the field of networks research. Yes, and this uh, theme of today is crisis response and crisis management. Peter. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. And as you can hear, I am coming from Hungary, and approximately 100 years ago, we were together with the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. But after the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, we are, const we are in a constant crisis. At least we feel so. Uh, maybe only in Hungary, I don't know, maybe you not, but, uh, but we certainly yes. Uh, I, I, my lecture will be about this crisis, and I would like to introduce you the responses to crisis from the point of biological networks. But the key point, as Manfred has told already in his introduction, would be that uh, this is fairly general behavior, and you can actually see about yourself or understand yourself a little bit better, perhaps, or at least I hope, uh, by the end of the lecture. Now, the first slide is about how we think about networks in my group. My group, uh, my network science group, is a pretty much a multidisciplinary group, uh, consisting of not only physicians, like in a medical university, but obviously from physicists, from, uh, from, from mathematicians, from even economy people. Uh, so we try to understand networks as a general phenomenon. It is very useful, or it is possible, because there are many, many uh, features of networks like the small wordness, you might uh, have heard about it quite a few, this is the famous six degrees of separation, as we usually call, uh, the very well connected networks, the hubs, the, the, the existence of, of, of nodes which have much more connections than average, the nested hierarchy, and the weak links, which have been already mentioned by, in, in the introduction, which, are, which seem to be all pretty general features of all networks, including social networks, where the nodes are people, the connections are, are personal contacts, and biological networks, where the nodes may be cells, like in our brain, or proteins, like in our cells. Uh, in, in my group, therefore, we are thinking always about this generality of network properties, and this makes us to utilize the billion years of experience, uh, 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 among others, in crisis of biological networks and to use it for our everyday life. And moreover, it is giving you or giving us a, a judgment of the importance of the finding. Because if the finding in network science was true only for a particular network, that may be an important finding, but if it was true for many types of networks, including social networks, biological networks and others, that is a fairly general finding, which may have a more general <coughs> application and maybe even more important. Lastly, but not, not least, uh, I would like to draw your attention that if you, if you generalize problems with a scrutinized scientific methodology, like network science, then you may end up with quite creative, quite novel solutions to your scientific problems. i just give you, give you one example in the next slide. Uh, the, but the basics is that when you, when you stop, when you don't have the solution to your problem in network science, in, in social networks, for example, 
then you may reconfigure, reformulate your original question to a biological network problem. You may talk about it in different words, and different solutions may come to your mind, or vice versa, you may reconfigure a biological problem to a social problem. Now, I'm just giving one example. This is a paper published in Nature by several uh, uh, well-known authors uh, approximately two years ago. And the paper, as, as the title says, is about early warning signals for critical transitions. Here, critical transitions are changes of complex systems which are unpredictable, which are large, and which are quite dangerous, especially if you are, if you are part of a complex system. The, the authors were comparing three completely different systems, ecosystems, so our, our neighborhood in the environment, market, uh, we all know that, and climate. And very surprisingly, but very uh, importantly, they found at least three, diff three uh, common uh, uh, responses of these various, very different systems when they are approaching a crisis, when they are approaching a critical transition. Now these were the following. A slower recovery from perturbations, so if the system was changed, then just before the crisis, it could return to the original state much slower than otherwise. Uh, second, which was related to this first one, an increased self-similarity of behavior, so the behavior was getting to kind of a routines, and, and it became more self-similar, you can measure it quite nicely by, uh, by, by various measures. And last but not least, an increased variance of fluctuation patterns, which I may kind of transcribe that once the system has been changed, then it was changing to, to the extremes mostly or, or more uh, 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 frequently when it was close to a critical transition than otherwise. Now, when I, when I was reading these three kind of statements, it occurred to me that, wow, we are dealing with aging in my laboratory, we are in a medical university, and if you think about an old person, a really, really old person, your grandmother, grandfather, or even great-grandmother, great-grandfather when they were alive, then you may recall similar uh, behavior patterns. When they are getting old, then you start to develop daily routines, and then you start to stick to these daily routines more and more, and if of a disturbance is coming, then, then you are getting really lost more and more, once you are getting older and older, uh, if someone is disturbing or something is disturbing you from this daily routine. So as a very short summary of this kind of thoughts or, 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 or generalizations, you might say, or you might, might challenge yourself to say, uh, or challenge the audience to say that aging is an aging early warning signal of a critical transition, and I think now you guess what is the critical transition, and I think you were right. So, indeed, uh, from the network point of view, that is a critical transition because before the network was connected, it had a giant component, we say, but after that, your brain, your cells, all of your networks in, in your body are disconnected quite abruptly, quite unexpectedly most of the time, so it is indeed a critical transition from the bona fide point of view. Now, I don't want to, uh, I mean, distract you with negative messages and very early in the morning, so I'm giving you the positive side as well, that uh, this will give you hints how you can prevent or how you can delay these critical transitions. And one of the major ideas is that prevention or delay is possible if you find nodes, elements, actors in this complex system which have a more unpredictable behavior than others. Why? Because in a critical transition, behavior is usually getting uh, similar. So the nodes are getting uh, to a similar type of behavior. They are synchronized in a way. If I would shout now that's fire, everyone would go to this direction. Maybe some of you would go to that direction. Those people might survive actually better because they would not kill each other on the single direction uh, or single entry. Uh, they came to this room. So if there is a behavior which is unpredictable, that may, may be helpful in different systems to survive, like omnivores, top predators in the ecosystems, market rules, and stem cells actually in our body. Uh, those are cells which are pretty much unpredictable. They can be each, each type of cell actually in the body, what is needed. Now, if you would like to generalize this or, or rationalize it in a network uh, science point of view, then you may define three different behaviors in networks. The first one is a problem solver, which is a specialized uh, uh, node, which is solving a certain problem, a certain task in the network. The next one is a problem distributor. This is usually a hub. 
This is not solving the problems itself, just distributing it to other nodes which are able to solve them. Now, the most important from the current point of view, from the lecture's point of view, is the third one, which I call creative node. This creative node is changing its position uh, in various network positions, not only in this tool, this was just a demonstration. So it's very dynamic and actually samples the network, samples the properties of the network, samples the possible solutions of the network, and therefore it is unpredictable. And it can be creative from the, from the real, I mean, from the everyday use point of view, because it can assemble different segments of the, of the novel solution from various points of the network, and, the, and, 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 and therefore the, the system itself can enjoy this uh, solution and creativity. I just would like to remind you that this, from this point of view, the creative person has an unsettable appetite for novel uh, environments and for novel solutions. And therefore, this person might be called as an entrepreneur from the Schumpeterian sense, and actually this type of person or this type of node is a network entrepreneur because it is uh, exercising this kind of property in the network. Now, from to exercise such a property, you actually need a continuous refocusing of social categories if the node is a person. Uh, and by this uh, refocusing, is, uh, the creative person understands others better, that others know her or his values better, connects isolated people, and, ex and what is more the most important, exponentially enriches herself and himself with knowledge, with new knowledge absorbed from the network. Moreover, this is actually a self amplifying circle, so it's quite beneficial. Since this creative node position is changing network position all the time, this also means that it is vacanting empty positions and letting others to occupy that position which he or she was occupying before. Now this is a very interesting feature of dynamic networks because this allows these dynamic networks to change the centrality all the time of the nodes and those nodes which were in the middle, which were central at this particular moment, may be on the side and may be supporting those nodes which, which are now in the center, novel nodes. Now, this is very similar to the, to the function of our brain. As you are sitting here, as I am standing here, our neural cells are getting active. But each second, different neural cells are active and different neural cells are in the middle of other neural cells which are also active. Uh, and this is changing. So that neural cell which is now in the middle, in the next moment, may be on the side and may support the next neural cell which is at that time in the middle of this particular circle. So this dynamics and this dynamical change of centrality is a very important feature of complex networks and I just would like to make the parallelism or the, or, the, or the analogy for the society that a society, a school, a firm is working really well, really in a complex manner if it is dynamic like that. So the boss is not always the boss in the traditional sense. Uh, there might be a chance for other people to get to the middle, to, 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 to get enjoy, to enjoy the support of the, of the community and this is dynamic. Now, this is a very complex slide and I'm just showing you for a moment to show the bad and, and, and suffering life of a biochemist. Uh, because biological data are messy and therefore you have to use many types of biological data if you would like to assess a network type phenomenon and you have to figure out which are those changes which are uh, uh, robust despite of changing the biological source, the data source, despite changing, uh, of changing the, the method, how you analyze the neural network and so on. So we are trying to find these type of robust changes and in the next minutes I will tell you of some of these robust changes in, in crisis, in, in, in yeast networks in crisis. But before that I am just giving you the method how we analyze this network. This is a method to understand, to find groups in network. Groups are densely connected segments, regions of the network, which are not so densely connected to their neighbor, to their neighboring 
This definition is pretty vogue definition. It is not a precise definition. It is not such precise as this formula on, on this board. And therefore, it is very difficult to construct methods to find groups uh, in the network. Clustering is a notoriously difficult problem in network science. Our uh, solutions for, solution for this problem has some steps which are giving you or giving the people who are using this method a pretty detailed knowledge about the network structure. The very first step is to construct a local influence island, a local uh, island of influence to each node or each, each edge of the network. So actually I am having here three local islands. This, this is actually a network of network scientists themselves, how they collaborate. So each node is a person, a network scientist, and each link is a collaboration by uh, a, a joint publication. Uh, so these are actually three network scientists, there are no network scientists on the field, uh, and uh, this is the influence zone of those network scientists where uh, they, they, they are in a very close and dense interaction with other network scientists. Now in the next step, we summarize these local influence zones and actually determine or, or, or define a third dimension, a vertical dimension, which we call community centrality, which is actually the sum of local nodes. So when a node is having a high position in this vertical centrality, it has a high community centrality. This means that this particular node was a part of many local influence zones. So that particular node is high because it is participating in a large number of these intimate contacts with, with the lo local neighborhood uh, and dense contacts with the local neighborhood. Interestingly, if you define this kind of community surface, then you may understand or you may end up to the solution that eventually uh, hills uh, on mountains, well, hills on this surface are the groups themselves, are the communities, the, the network communities themselves, and eventually these communities will be very much overlapping. If you would like to get more information, that you can download it from our website, even as a Cytoscape plugin, which is uh, uh, make it easier to use, and our website is labels.hu, and this is at the modules.php uh, part. Now, this uh, understanding of community centrality, so actually summarized influence on the network and from the network to that particular node, makes you to understand or helps you to understand the importance of that particular node in the overall network configuration and overall network traffic interaction structure. Which, which is having an interesting example in crisis, and now I, I, from now on I'm focusing on crisis events in yeast and in other uh, organisms. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is the protein-protein interaction network of yeast, and yeast you know from beer or from bread or from, from, from various uh, daily products that you consume. Uh, here a node is a protein, and an interaction between two nodes is a physical interaction between two proteins. Interestingly, when the yeast cell is allowed to divide, because there is plenty of food in the neighborhood, so there is no crisis at all, it is dividing exponentially, then those proteins which are involved in the division, in the expansion of the yeast cell, so for example the proteins involved in protein synthesis, in multiplying the proteins themselves, are the most important proteins of this network structure. Importantly and interestingly, these proteins are losing their importance in crisis. Because in crisis, the yeast cell is top divide, so it is not growing any longer. But importantly, the proteins which are degrade the proteins, so doing just the converse of the, of the, of the, of the previous task, are getting the important. Because in crisis, you have to make an order. In crisis, you have to get rid of those proteins, which, which, become, uh, they, which become erroneous, which, which, which uh, were having a bad structure, or were oxidized, or having another problem, or, or some other uh, 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 chemical uh, change during the crisis. And therefore, protein degradation is becoming important. Interestingly, a lot of survival processes are getting really important as well, understandably, because the cell has to survive this particular crisis. Now, this again is a little bit complicated, complex figure. I am just uh, uh, focusing your attention to this white take-home message. In a stressed yeast network, the major observation was 
that the groups, which are overlapping groups, are not overlapping any longer to the extent as they were before the crisis, during the crisis. So in a crisis, what is actually happening, that a group is getting more condensed, is getting more uh, 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 closed from the environment, and intergroup connections are getting less in the crisis than they were before. So before the crisis, the yeast cell was behaving like a complex organized entity. Everything was connected with everything. It was, it was really a large traffic going through the various groups and they were exchanging various information and, and physical reactions and all, those, all these things. In the crisis, there are some remaining connections, obviously, because this makes the network a network, but the number of connections between the groups is small. Now, if you remember or recall our everyday behavior when a crisis is coming to, in our family, in our firm, in our community, then this is how we react at the very first moment to the crisis, that let's get in closer, let's try to help each other only in the very closest community, let's close the family and close the family lines and, and help uh, and try to survive together in this small group. So the behavior is pretty similar. And one reason why it is similar that noise and damage cannot propagate from a group to another group if the connections between the two groups are not so many as before. In a crisis, problems are propagating all around. In, in the cell, it is free radicals actually, because in, in, in the cellular crisis, free radicals are uh, uh, abundant and they are damaging the proteins. If there is a group of proteins and it is connected with another group of proteins uh, uh, very intimately, then the chance that these free radicals problems are processing from one group to another, this is high. If the two groups were disjoint, then the chance that the problem is processing from one group to the other, it is small. I will give you just a very everyday example. If there is a, uh, an infection, there is an epidemic going on, then you impose a quarantine and you don't let your children go to school. This is the very same behavior because you disjoin the group of the school from the group of your family and therefore you are not allowing the procession of the problem which is in this case an epidemic infection. Uh, so these systems are fairly similar in their responses when there is a crisis going on but I would like to draw your attention to the second thing. Because we are very good to learn the first phase. How we can close our communities when there is a crisis. This is the first phase. But there is a second phase. And the second phase is to reconfigure the whole system. To allow the system to have links between communities which were very distant uh, from each other in the original network. Now this is a very complete reconfiguration of the network. And this allows the whole system to develop a new solution in the crisis. Now, this is a point where we are not really good in society, especially in Hungary, I don't know Austria that much, maybe you are much better than other countries, but in Hungary we are certainly not that, that good in that, so we may have a lesson to learn. <coughs> oh, uh, with a few slides I just would like to show that this phenomenon is pretty general, even from the scientific point of view. Uh, Uri Allen and his co-workers were uh, summarizing the metabolic networks of 117 bacteria which were living in different environments. The, 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 the difference in the environment was how the environment was changing. Several bacteria which are here were living in, a, in another bacterium or in another organism, so they were symbionts. They had a very constant environment because they were in the middle of another organism. Other bacteria were living in a very variable environment. What was the take-home message and what was the, 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 the essence of these findings? That the modularity, the more separate modules, was increasing quite significantly from uh, 0.25 to 0.45, and this was a large significant increase. Uh, when the bacteria were transferred or when they were living in, in, a, in a constant environment versus a uh, very changing environment. Now, you may recall this kind of yeast situation when the yeast had a kind of happy life, um, everything was okay, there were resources, there was not so much change, 
Then the yeast had a low modularity, so they were not so separated in modules in the yeast cell. However, when the, the situation was changed, there was a stress, all of a sudden the yeast cell modules were becoming separated. But I would like to record that that was a protein protein interaction network, and this is a metabolic network. So these are two different networks behaving the same way. These are our own data about the metabolic network showing the very same feature. And this is a telephone uh, call network uh, obtained from other Laszlo Barabashi. And these are telephone calls in an average week, the black one, black line on the, on the, on the, on the bottom. The red line on the top is uh, 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 dis describing telephone calls at a bombing event, at a terrorist attack. Uh, what turned out that in an everyday life, the network, your telephone connection network, is uh, having uh, uh, communities which are pretty much overlapping. So you are calling distant people, I mean distant friends, and so on. On the contrary, when you are in a trouble, when there was a terrorist attack, then you are not calling distant friends. Then you are calling your mother, your spouse, your daughter, your son, you, the very close people, you are, they are the closest to you, and therefore the network community, which can be observed during this event, is a very close community, is a very uh, 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 dense community, and actually these communities are getting very distanced, very um, uh, 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 di discriminated from each other during this, this, this stressful event. So actually social stress, and quite a broad one, this terrorist type of event, is producing a similar type of network change as the others. I'm just listing you here other networks like the brain, like the ecosystem, other social networks, uh, which are changing similarly when the number, when the resources are changing. So the general take-home message from all this segment of my lecture that if you have plenty of resources and you have no stress, then the network is very close to a random network. If there are communities, where well, in the random network there are no communities really, but if it's not completely random, if there are communities, they are over, overflowing each other, uh, they, are, they are indiscriminatable from each other, the network structure is not really well defined. If stress is imposed, if resources are less, then the network is developing communities. After a while, the communities is getting, they are getting distracted from each other, and at the very end, eventually, these communities will break. And so these communities will form subgraphs or subnetworks, and the whole connection structure of the network is broken. This is an extreme stress or extremely low resources. Now, this behavior can be observed at the phenotype as well. So how the network behaves, how the complex system behaves. And very interestingly, in many systems, I will show you only two, uh, different phenotypes can be observed if there is a lot of resources as compared if there are very few, very little resources. The first network or first complex system I'm showing you is ourselves, human metabolism. It has been defined or understood quite a while ago actually, 10 years ago approximately, that human metabolism can have two basic forms. One form is when we have a lot of resources, when there, are, there is a lot of food available. This form we call a kind of large phenotype, which is an overspending phenotype. In this case, human metabolism is not really taking care of the efficiency. I mean, digesting food only half. Because it will have food tomorrow, it will have food in the evening, it will have food every time. So why to bother? to digest it completely, very efficiently, each bit of that, and so on. So this is the, we call it the large phenotype. On the contrary, if there was famine, if there was a scarcity of food, not if there was low resources for a longer time, then an, a different phenotype develops, which we call small phenotype. This is a very thrifty phenotype. That metabolism is digesting each bit of food, because it is not quite certain that I will get another chance to, to eat something uh, in the evening or in the next morning. So whatever I have, I have to use 100% efficiency or close to 100% efficiency. Interestingly, these two phenotypes are changing very slowly. You need sometimes as much as three generations to change from one phenotype to another. 
Now, this might be a reason why in developing countries, and developing countries in the sense like India and China, the major uh, 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 economic powers of the world by now, uh, when food was not available plentiful like 100 years ago, but now it is not for many, well, not for everyone, but for quite many uh, people, it is available. Diabetes and obesity is so prevalent because the, the metabolism is still thrifty, but the input is a large input or became a large input or larger than it was. Now, my last, second and last example is of Janusz Kornai, the famous Hungarian economist. And uh, Mr. Kornai is famous because of many things, but uh, one thing certain that he defined socialism, and, I mean the, the Hungarian system 20 years ago or more than 20 years ago, as a shortage economy. Now in his recent work, which was published now in Hungarian, and it is coming up in English, so I'm kind of warning you if you'd like to read it, then in a year perhaps you can find it in the English market, uh, which is Thoughts About Capitalism. Uh, Professor Kornai defines capitalism as a surplus society. So it's very interesting that even at the society level you have this dualistic function or dualistic feature that, that if the resources are low, then you have a society which is kind of thrifty, which is kind of shrinking, which is kind of uh, having a very, very uh, simple structure, that is socialist. And if the resources are not so low, they are, they are pretty good, uh, then you have a society which is a surplus society, which is capital. So, uh, obviously, these are very long, long uh, very, very distant kind of analogies. Uh, I don't want to prove them scientifically. I just would like to raise your attention that such interesting uh, uh, parallelisms may be found if you are thinking about the behavior of systems under different conditions. <coughs> but here you have to concentrate on the bottom of the figure because this is the important take-home message. I am here comparing two systems, which are the kind of small phenotype system and the large phenotype system, which are on the two sides of this bottom panel. The small phenotype system is usually a rigid system, which means that the structure is very dense, as it was in the dense uh, community structures in crisis, and therefore it is unable to change. So if you compare its possibilities to learn something, to adapt for something, and to remember to that adaptation, so the effect of the adaptation, which means kind of memory type of event, then if the system is very rigid, then it is unable to change, because it is very rigid. You, you are not able to change it. I am really having difficulties if I would like to change this table. This is pretty rigid. But once it's changed, already changed, then it remembers, then it has memory, because it is rigid, it can keep the changes. So it's like an elephant, it is, when, it's, when it's learning something, then it's remembering for a life. However, if you go to the other extreme, to this large phenotype, at an extreme form, that is a very flexible system. If you have a, a structureless system, it has no uh, uh, modules. If it has modules, then the modules are overconfluent. You cannot discriminate them, and so on. Close to a network. If a network is like that, very flexible, then to adapt to a new situation, that's no problem. I mean, this growth can adapt to any situation. This is flexible. But to keep that situation, to, to have a memory, to, to really remember to that particular change, that is really impossible. I mean, a cloth like that, it is not doing that. It doesn't have a memory. It is not rigid to the extent to have a memory. Now, what is really useful, what is really complex, what is really helpful for the evolution, that is what is in the middle. That is a balanced system. A balanced system, a complex system, does have parts which are rigid, but at the same time, it does have parts which are flexible. So therefore, at the same time, it can adapt, it can change, but it can remember, it can stay, it can, it can, it can uh, memorize or keep that change for a while, so the adaptation efficiency is pretty high. If you would like to get a treatment, a scientific treatment of this uh, change is not in the sense of flexibility or, 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 uh, or, or, uh, or rigidity, but in the sense of robustness, which has a quite 
many connections with these uh, uh, ideas that I would like to draw your attention of this nature paper by Wagner and Tolkien, uh, when they actually proved in a, in a simulation system that in the systems with immediate robustness are adapting faster uh, than other systems with extreme robustness, extremely small or extremely large robustness. So going back to the previous example, when there was a stress, then actually the system was shifting its uh, composition, structure, and behavior from a very flexible system, actually too flexible system, to a, to a complex system which is flexible and rigid at the same time. And it, it, this is what we actually observed when the yeast cell uh, was having a crisis. So getting to the end of my talk, I would like to uh, just give you take, two take-home messages. And the very first take-home message is that biological networks actually offer the experience of billion years of crisis survival. So it is worth to look at them because sometimes our own behavior in the society is not that kind of perfect, as I say, as I would say, as biological systems behavior, which is not surprising because in the society we have a, we have a generation time of a few hundreds or at best thousands, but biological systems have a generation times of millions, if not billions, themselves, which is, which is having a, a greater ground for experience. Now, the second uh, take-home message is that community rearrangements, group rearrangements, network community rearrangements, may be a general mechanism for uh, a system level adaptation because it is cheap. If you have uh, if you have a plan to change your system in a way that I will change complete parts of the system, I will renew complete parts of the system, that is expensive. Because then you have to build up that part from scratch, completely new. If you have an idea that I do have the parts of the system, they will pretty much be unchanged, but I just reconfigure the connection structure of these parts. That can give you a number of new responses at the system level, but it is cheap because all the parts remain more or less the same. Now, this is what is actually used by the yeast cell when the yeast cell is reconfiguring the protein-protein interaction network. Major parts are preserved, but the configuration, the connection structure of these parts is completely renewed. And this is what is giving another possibility for the yeast cell. So this is what we may also learn for such, from such systems. And eventually, I mean, this very last kind of pattern that I showed you before, it is also part of the take-home message that you may consider a nice and delicate balance between rigidity and flexibility in complex systems, because most extremes are not really useful or not really helpful for uh, changes or for remembering the changes in the longer term. Now, in my very last slide, I would like to just to uh, thank or acknowledge the contribution of the people of my group. Uh, these are only the people who are taking part in this, in this particular study, including Andras Longo, who is in the audience and who will have a lecture in symposium. Oh, this is the part of the of the uh, of the of the of the, of the reclam, uh, uh, in this in this morning. And uh, obviously this group is multidisciplinary as I told you, so it is open for collaboration. So if anyone in the audience feels that he or she wants to collaborate with us, we are very happy. That these are the potential collaborators. As, as Manfred told, uh, my group about my, my group about networks, the weak links, is freely available from Google, so you don't even have to pay for it anything uh, which is in a crisis a positive sign. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, actually, I would formulate the answer or the problem in a different way. Uh, we observe facts in this biological system as we observe uh, connections, physical connections of these proteins in experiments like these two hybrid systems or uh, co immune precipitation <laughs> systems. So we do have a lot of data on these interactions and the coding is posed by ourselves actually if, from my understanding that we understand this complexity of data from the network point of view which means that we define nodes in the networks we define the, the, the category which we consider to be a node which may be a protein, may be a person, may be a cell in these cases the definition might seem to be easy because okay I know what is a protein I know what is a person, I know what is a cell if I know but uh, many times this definition is getting very difficult if we got to the point that we try to define the interaction itself the edge in the graph that is getting even more difficult if we try to uh, define the weight of this edge that is getting even more difficult I'm just giving you one example about social networks we are working with one, one, many social networks but one of the social networks is the Ed Health Networks from the United States. That is a social network about school children. Now, these school children were uh, monitored for, for a longer time, and, uh, sorry, yeah. please. But, yes, I, I understand that okay. part of the problem. But in essence, how do we give meaning to the communication you wish us to encode from your message? Oh, I see. Thank you for, for, for the additional question, uh, or for the explanation of the original. Uh, uh, in a social network or in a, in a neural network where neural cells or people are communicating we have everyday kind of concepts on the, on the communication we have everyday kind of concepts of the information change it is a bit indeed more difficult to conceptualize the communication in a protein-protein interaction network however there is communication communication at the protein-protein interaction level is a physical type of communication these proteins are changing the shape all the time and these ch ch shape changes are not independent from each other. These co proteins are bound to each other in the cell, either transiently or, or constantly. So if one of them is changing its shape, then the other one at, besides it has to change its shape as well. This is a communication. So actually, this type of physical, more or less physical type of communication patterns, whether I kick the neighboring protein or not, this can be understood at this particular level as, as communication kind of. But without a, a code in the sense of Shannon or other, or a genetic code or, or these sorts of codes? Well, um, I, certainly in, from this sense of uh, uh, view, there is not such a well developed theory uh, of coding uh, uh, at this level. Partly maybe because these systems are messy. So, uh, not all very well developed and clear theories can be applied to these systems. But in the sense of, of, the, of the connection structure, of the connection uh, uh, data, you have your real data and, and you are starting from your real data. So, I mean, yeah, this is, this is the background. Yeah, uh, I think first, first that. Yeah. Uh, Um, yes, it is connected uh, to self-organized criticality. I can't really tell you at the moment how it is exactly connected to self-organized criticality because uh, these changes in these systems, I mean, our current treatment or people's current treatment for these changes in these network systems are restricted more or less to one step. There was this normal state, there is this stressed state. Now, in the self-organized criticality, you have not one step. You have, you have thousands or millions, or I mean, a number of steps. So it's a whole continuous process. Once we develop data uh, enough and, and we can analyze data enough for a whole continuous process, I think then it will be a very relevant question what you post that the self-organized criticality and this kind of concept can be conceptualized together or not. I think yes, but this is currently a feeling. This is not currently a fact. Uh, so I have a somewhat unfair question. Um, 
So of course network theory is a wonderful approach and we have an excellent presentation how to use it for biological and social organization. But this is a conference on cybernetic and system research which has a 40 years history. And the history tells us there were several major bullets. Cybernetic theory of living structures, connectivity with thermodynamic approach to open systems, living systems as catastrophes and bifurcations. So now we have network theory. So how to all these theories is that there was a rise and fall of these theories, many times related to one or two persons, one school. So how do you see the future of the network science? This is will be made with us for the next 200 years, or, do you, or it is just some kind of transient fish. And of course, fishes come and fall, they help us, and then something else will come. How do you see it in, 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 in Thank you very much for this question. I think this is not an unfair question, this is a very good question. Uh, uh, indeed, there were kind of uh, scientific uh, fashions uh, regarding many, many types of the, of, the, of the theories, what you mentioned, or approaches, what you mentioned. Uh, and network science uh, was kind of rising very fast in the last 10 years. I think this rising in popularity is partly because we do have now data, and we do have now capacity to store this data and capacity to, to retrieve this data. So formerly, if, we, if you had this data, well, you had difficult before the, before the computer science age, which is kind of 20 years, I mean, or, or, or slightly more, but, but not, not much more, actually, personal computers, I mean, uh, every, everyone's success. Uh, and biology especially uh, had no data like 10 years before to the extent which would be understood or would be analyzed at the systems level, including network. Uh, I don't know whether I will be a network scientist 10 years from now. So uh, 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 I, I was not a network scientist 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know whether I will be 10 years, uh, how, where will I be uh, 10 years from now. Currently I feel that there are many uh, uh, ideas, concepts, and behaviors which you can catch by networks and which are robust. But that's why I am very much interested in networks at the moment. I don't know for how long, how, many, how much more time you will be able to discover these very kind of robust, general, and interesting changes with the network kind of description. <laughs> but at the moment, the field is very rich. Uh, I don't see any uh, pauperization of the field at all. So the field is getting at the moment richer and richer, and more and more interesting for me or for the people who are in the network science. Obviously this will have a peak, obviously this will have a kind of downward trade. When? I don't know. Maybe 10 years, maybe 20. We will see. Uh, I think you're going first. Uh, sorry. How do you determine the border of a network? Well, that is a very relevant question. Uh, I mean, if you are talking about a cell, then more or less you have an understanding about the border of the network, which is within the cell that is belonging to that particular network, protein-protein interaction network or whatever, which is outside that is not. But even in this case, where the cell really ends, I mean, the, the, net, the receptors on the outer surface that is certainly inside the cell, I mean, it is, they are belonging to the cell. The proteins which are bound to the receptors, are they, they part of the cell or are they part of the outer territory, the extracellular matrix? Whatever? So, I mean, this is a very relevant question. It's very difficult to answer. Uh, to... um, when you say the cell, so you start from a phenomenal uh, system. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. You identification. What that would be interesting is when you uh, see the network and you study it, that you see that it crosses your initial boundary. Well, I mean, from the network point of view, if you would like, so you don't have any general knowledge about the system itself, <coughs> you don't have a conceptualization of the system, then you have to rely on the contact structure. Then you have to rely to find groups in the system, and if you found very well defined groups, then you may identify them as subsystems or, 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 or that you may say that this is the boundary of the group. But in fact, these groups are overlapping all the time. So th that is one of the most difficult questions of the network science at the moment, of the post, uh, where to find the boundary of the system 
only coming from the network information and not, not to take into account any other information. Yes. Oh, okay, sorry, please. Uh, in the introduction that was mentioned that you sat on a committee in Hungary, would you like to comment on how this research is used purposefully to inform public policy? Uh, if it can be or if it can't be? Uh, the network science as yes. such. Uh, uh, yeah, I think um, there are many, many social problems which can be conceptualized as networks, like at the moment in Hungary, and I think in many other countries, we have big problems with healthcare. Uh, healthcare is actually a network of the different hospitals, of different uh, institutions, patients themselves. So it can be conceptualized in, by, by this, from this point of view. So actually it can help public policy from, from understanding the complexity of the system they work with. This is one thing. The other thing is this kind of more, I mean, or should I say difficult thing, to, to make analogies. Uh, what I try to make in my lecture and try to understand the examples what biological and other systems gives us in various situations. I think this may also help the, the public kind of understanding and, and, and decision making if there are people who have a sense of that uh, sitting <laughs> at the decision making. So this might be more difficult. Uh, <laughs> Yes, please, the right point. Uh, sure. It seems like the biological networks, they have a memory. So if you start to start to count, they sort of remember it. And I, I call it, but uh, let's take the uh, man made, uh, man -made uh, networks, which are most of the people are telecommunication instruments and about the rest of it. Systems and uh, when research has been made, uh, it's, they go from the standpoint that uh, the disruption is not it's an isolated or random occurrence, and, and there's not any memory in the system. But there's also made uh, in EU, for instance, the parts in research regarding the electricity grids, they show that. Actually, they have a certain kind of memory, a certain pattern of the disruption. If they come some kind of disruption now, then they still expect afterwards a different kind of disruption. So they also seem to have a certain memory. Have you made any research on the memory in, in the network? Uh, we are currently making this, oh. this research, so I, I, unfortunately I can't give you data or, or, or real results yet. Just an idea I would like to enrich your, 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 your comment, which is a very uh, key point, I think, that uh, formerly, 100 years ago, engineering was more or less producing rigid networks in the sense that those constructions which were made 100 years ago had only a few parts, the few parts had a very defined interaction pattern, which wasn't really changing, and it, it, if it was changing, then we said the, the system was broken. Uh, at the moment, we do have engineered systems like the electricity systems and all the others you mentioned, which are not of this type, which, which, which again, which, which shifted from this very kind of rigid structure to this, to the, to, towards the middle. So towards the structure when they do have also kind of more or less flexible parts. Flexible means here the more expensive parts. So now we, we are sacrificing a little bit more money, not to get the more, most utility system which is possible, the most, the cheapest system, which is possible, because it, it is not really reliable, it is not having this memory, it is not, it is breaking easily, uh, but we, we sacrifice more money, and therefore we are getting a bit closer to the systems which have been evolved in, in biology. So I think now the two sciences, biology and engineering, have more in common, more to, talk, to tell each other, because of this kind of behavior and change. Um, I have a question. Uh, this network uh, analysis is often done with a view of a big network. Um, but we, we, did, we, we depend on actions of local knowledge or the interest of local knowledge. Uh, what are the possibilities for local assessment of what is involved in the development of the network and the local assessment of the implications of uh, changes? 
Yes, this is a very common uh, problem if you are studying large, really large networks because you don't have the information what we have about biological cells. Biological cells are pretty small from this point of view. The yeast has only 6,500 proteins and maybe 200,000 links. This is nothing compared to the internet or compared to the World Wide Web or, or the whole social network of mankind uh, or, or, or your brain. Uh, now, in these latter cases, indeed, sampling of networks, especially local sampling, is a crucial point. Uh, I don't think we are at the end of the story, of, uh, and, and that's why your question is so uh, relevant. Uh, uh, how to find a good sampling system for uh, the locality of the network to reveal the complex structure of the network? Most of the networks, or many of the networks, have a kind of well, more or less fractal structures or hierarchical structures. So you may have a kind of extrapolation from the local structure to the global one. But whether your extrapolation is really true, well, uh, uh, I mean, I would be safer if you may extrapolate for three or more scales of hierarchy, and then you extrapolate one more, so the fourth scale or the fifth scale. That is safer. At the moment, we are having one scale only, this is the local kind of understanding of the network, and we are trying to extrapolate to the fifth scale. Now, this is not working, so we have to get more advanced uh, sampling and, and, and extrapolating structures. I think you first, please. Sorry. Um, overall, um, what is the relevance of the network Uh, it's a very good question. Actually, I don't really have a good answer to this question. I mean, my, my first answer is no, that we, we don't really assess quality type of changes or interactions from the quality point of view uh, with this network sense. Uh, but I think, uh, that's, that's my feeling, that if we will advance in the dynamics, in the network dynamics, then we may have in the future some information from the dynamics, from the refined dynamics, on the quality. I'm just giving one example, which is a very simple example, and it's not worth well out. We are working with uh, spatial games in this network system, when you can define various social games, like the Prisoner's Dilemma game, the Ultimate game, and other games. Uh, and we are using it for the interactions for the cooperativity of protein-protein interaction networks. Now, I, I start to have the notion that it is, it is educative what type of social dilemma game you are using in, to the particular protein-protein interaction network to the quality of that interaction. So from, from such, I mean, initial points, you, I mean, one may end up, not now, later on, uh, to get closer to your question, but at the moment I think we are far from it. Okay. I understand. That's cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm wondering, with regard to, combining with the question about the boundaries and the questions about the memories in the system, looking at the epigenetic landscape, mm -hmm. how the system then, uh, uh, the, the processes change. Taking this from the, what we're getting from the areas of quantum physics and looking at non-local uh, correlations, state correlations, and even trans-temporal state correlations. Are you um, bringing this into there in terms of how the system actually aligns itself and it develops its own? The question of boundaries again, where does the change develop from and is there a role for the attachment character? Yeah, actually I think we are, again, I mean, my, my answers will be quite the same at the, all the time. We are getting closer to understand it from the network point of view as well. Epigenetics haven't been covered that well with networks at this point, as far as I, as I know, because of the complexity of, of the changes and because of the complexity of the types of the changes, which are, this is the question which we discussed, that it is, 
it is very difficult to conceptualize something in the network point of view when changes are different. So we have this type of DNA methylation, one thing, uh, histone phosphorylation, another thing. Should I consider it the same type of link? Well, I mean, so this is when, when things are getting difficult from the network point of view. Obviously, you have colored graphs, so you can make up a network like that, but the colored graph theory is not really, at the moment, to biology, uh, so it is not, not, okay. So getting back to your point, this uh, long distance interaction and kind of system level interaction from this point of view uh, are, I think, very well tackled by networks at the moment. I would like just to refer to our own method, what I showed. When you have a local community starting from a single node, but that local community many times expands to the whole network. Not to the same intensity, obviously it's more intense locally and it's less intense at a distance, but there is another node, it, do, it does have again a local community, and these two local communities are overlapping each other, and actually all local communities are overlapping each other. So this is getting you a complexity of kind of long distance changes or long distance interactions, which you can, which you can uh, uh, formulate uh, or uh, rationalize from the network point of view at the moment. So I think this is a very encouraging field, what you mentioned, from this point of view, from, from the, from the long-distance, complex interaction point of view, because otherwise it's difficult to understand it, but if you get it bit by bit, for example, by help of a network or other realizations, then, then it then is more helpful. Our mind is too limited uh, to understand it as such, so we need help than networks provide. Yes, please. Would you bring to mind is the holographic information nestedness? Yeah. Does that factor into the network? That, of course, is in play in, in bombs and many other frames looking at intricate external orders. Is, is that. Yeah, if you start to think about network dynamics, I think this is the only way how you can think about it. So uh, this is getting more and more into network science. Not each bit of that, and not especially the papers which were five years ago or more. But currently, yes. Currently, yes. Okay. Well, I think yes. yeah. last question. I think because we have time for. Referring to the the network and that's had a dynamic control. You know, it's not always statically on the spot. Is that coming from the work of Warren McCulloch where he spoke about redundancy of the <coughs> Yeah, we, this, this type of redundant uh, and, and degenerate uh, uh, kind of uh, regulation is, is, is playing a great role, a big, major role in, in biological system regulation. So, yeah, it is relevant. Uh, uh, and others which, which are touching this issue. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I think, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just reminded me on this